the concept of money, um, financial wellness, financial well-being, um, particularly, you know, with that focus on on women, because you know, I mean, we are we are all living so much longer that it really, you know, we're living six to eight years longer than men on oh, average. Oh, yeah. on average, and that's just the statistical average. And you know where else? Because quality lasts. <laughs> <laughs> but that's um. But I think it's it's. It, more so now it's even more important irrespective of where you are at what stage what age what's going on for you in your life it is relevant um money financial wellness financial well-being um you know having that you know that understanding and I mean obviously a lot of stuff we're going to have a chat about today I think it doesn't it doesn't differentiate across um you know I've always said this over social and economic um areas ages um, you know, all that sort of thing. It, it really, it's just as important when you're starting out as when you're sort of, you know, when you're in your in your in your later years of life. It's it's just as important to to understand it. And if you if you don't, then you know, obviously, what we're going to talk about today, the ramifications of what can happen, and the impact it can have, you know, as a flow and effect through your rest of your life. Um, so it's it's so important. Yeah. Where, in your opinion, does self-sabotage come into the undoing of that wellness well I think it's driven a lot around a self-worth first of all like I think it's all tied in together but like I mean a lot of stuff I do with particularly with women is you know that that incessant self-talk that we have which is (laughs) never particularly positive um, particularly around money and our ability with money and our finances and that sort of thing and it's it's um it's 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 so that comes in and sort of knocks us off our our ped like it, it is a self sabotage and I guess you know going back to that um of when I started my business like thinking everything was you know people were going to come along and then there was that realization that my I was actually you know self sabotaging I'm a bit of a I've been a bit of a queen of self sabotaging in the past I know a little bit about it um that it's the person that I had to be as a, you know, I mean, because I was selling myself as a coach, you know, I wasn't selling widgets. I was actually, so it was all about myself and as myself, as a coach. As a the, valuable as, entity. So yeah. you were the commodity that exactly, was being exactly, marketed. Exactly. Do so, you think that you had to take like from that aha moment was the next step accountability? Like, is that what you would recommend if I came to see you as a client? Would you say, yeah. okay, Here's the underlying issues um, that you tease out of them in a consult. And then is the first step, like anything in any healing process, is taking personal accountability and responsibility. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, absolutely, 100%. It's actually being open and ready. Like I feel, you know, I mean, I could, I, I could, I could talk to anyone about this sort of stuff, but it's, it's not, that's not my, that's not for me to do. I mean, I'm, I'm support people that are open and ready to have a look at this and it's not (laughs) unfortunately as human beings we have to something kind of you know we have to something bad or you know totally what a great (laughs) lesson what a great trigger it is for exactly there has to be we have to learn through adversity which is you know an unfortunate thing um but so you know I I love it if I can get people that are not actually you know (laughs) holding themselves right against the fire to actually, you know, support them and 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 really look at this stuff and hold them, yeah, exactly, hold them, have that accountability, that support, that you know, that knowing, that understanding, and I guess you know, having been through and experienced a lot this a lot of this stuff myself, I can see it very. I can, you mean, because <laughs> I've been down in the trenches um, about all this stuff, so I really understand and I get it. So it's not something I've learned in a course or read in a book or whatever. It's actually I've lived and breathed it more times than I'd like to admit. But it, it but you know, I mean, I, which I think it makes me a bloody good coach because I get it. Yes. And when you start looking into other people's uh, attitude and and wellness and psychological kind of views around money, it makes you really look inwards and go, mm. oh my goodness, I'm getting anxious watching this because this feels very close to the bone. It's resonating. It's resonating. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So. I think that's, you know, I mean, it's a really, and it's, it's not a, you know, I always say to people, it's not right or wrong or good or bad. It just is what it is. And so it's, it's, and I've, I've like some of the feedback I get 
um, from clients is that they, from working with me is that they say, you take the emotion out of money. They're just like, and I get to the point where they're just figures, they're just numbers. And actually understanding those numbers is really liberating and empowering to then be able to go and make decisions around, you know, financial decisions or lifestyle decisions or whatever the decisions are um, once we've got that, once we've got that knowledge and that information. So, you know, you need to know, you know, where and what you spend your money on first to then be able to make educated, informed decisions about where and what you'll spend your money on. But you have to know that first bit before you can do the second bit. So it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's confronting, it's scary, but hands down, it's probably one of the most liberating things I do with my clients is actually for them to understand that, to get and, that knowledge, to get can that I understanding. Ask you, do they do that by themselves or if they're married or with a partner, do they do that together? How? What do you recommend we do as a starting point? Mm. Whether I, I go through and, and do two separate pieces of, um, I can I separate out your spending um, or financial commitments into fixed costs, which is kind of all your everything you spend on a regular ongoing basis. So it's all your big ticket items that you spend on a regular um, a basis. So it might be your mortgage, Botox, your rent. Face cream. <laughs> <laughs> all of those. And that that could, be, could be lifestyle or not. But, yeah, so all your bills, um, we go through and do a piece of reviewing all those and getting them as efficient as possible. So that's, that's sort of that sort of things. And then I also look at people with regards to their lifestyle spending, so which is pretty much anything that's not a fixed cost and every time you walk out the door and put your hand in your pocket, that's um that's a fixed cost. Oh, sorry, lifestyle spending. So I get people to actually track those that lifestyle spending for for thirty days because you've got a lot of um, flexibility and I guess pliability of you know if there's some areas that you do want to um, start you know moving money towards. Once you understand where you're spending that money on your lifestyle, you can maybe sort of like. Um, I'm not, I never talk, I don't like using the word budget. I don't like using, um, you know, it's not, so it's not about budgeting. It's not about going without, it's not about scorched earth. It is about making, getting very, very clear. So this comes back to, you know, I do a lot of stuff around values, value-based decision-making. Um, what's important to you in your life to make sure that you've got money available for. So it's not about going without and doing a budget and denying yourself. It's getting very, very clear on what is important to you and making sure there is money available for that. But you spoke about neuroplasticity when it mm. when it comes to your money story, when it comes to your financial thoughts and behavior. Can you expand on that subject? Because sure. I find that aspect quite exciting yeah. because it feels like that's something you can change. Absolutely. Like you can change it. So basically like, you know, all those say those sayings, you know, our thoughts create our reality, or if we can think it, we can achieve it. You know, I mean, they are all true. Or where your focus goes, your in where you, you know where your focus goes, your energy flows. So, you know, a big piece I do with people is actually really unpacking their um their their money beliefs and blocks, or the negative self talk that they say to themselves in their in their mind, and also what comes out of their mouth. And it can be usually not very complimentary. And a lot of times it's not even true. These are just stories. They're stories that we've carried around in our, in our subconscious our whole lives. And a lot of the times when you actually question them and look at them, they're not even yours. They could be your families. They could be ancestral. You know, I mean, it's all passed down through um, our family of origin and stuff like that because that's obviously where we, you know, where we're hanging out when we're little people. So it's really having a look at that. And then, you know, going through and reframing and questioning all those, you know, those, those, those statements and those thoughts and those beliefs and really and reframing them into actually positive, relevant, real beliefs. So I guess, you know, would you, I was having this conversation with someone this morning, would you be rather focusing on what you're, what you don't have enough of, what you're missing out on, what you're, you know, what is what's going all the negative stuff that's going on in your life because I can tell you if you're focusing over there your brain universe god whoever you want to talk about is going oh right so that's where you're focusing it's not whether you want it or don't want it it's going oh so you're focusing over there that's where your energy is so you want more of that do you think the financial institutions have cottoned on to the fact that they're you know between financial advisors and um, TikTok, 
that they, <laughs> they there's a role for some financial education, financial responsibilities. I know in the US, you know, uh, providing financial coaching is, mm. is now becoming one of the things uh, as part of the wellness packages of executives of uh, as a retention and as mm. a recruitment tool. Mm. Have you seen any shift in that in Australia? Are, are we, you know, following on from that? Are financial institutions, do they have any kind of free services or uh, anything that we can tap into? Look, I think they they do. I think they. I think we've got a long way to go. Like I know, you know, I mean, in in the states and also in the UK, like you know, you can become a certified money coach. Um, there's actually a, a qualification designation, and I know quite a lot of women that have done either one or both um, that I've actually supported to become, funnily enough, to become money coaches or or to move into that space. So it's it's a much bigger thing. Um, you know, like. like like I started this, what, eight, nine years ago now, or 2013, 10 years ago now, where I sort of started my journey at when I left corporate. And I think, you know, I but didn't But your realize... background is in finance, right? Exactly. You... But it was, but it was all very, trans. you know, it was, it was, it was very transactional. And, you know, I mean, I did a lot of stuff in the retirement space and, and that sort of thing. But the thing I loved the most was actually working with people. Like that's like actually understanding and working with people and supporting them. Um, around that and I think what's happening is that there's going to be a there is this big gap well which is why one of the reasons I actually started my business that people that don't necessarily need financial advice or um, you know are not ready for financial advice or they don't need a full-blown financial advice and don't get me wrong financial advice is super super important for lots of different areas um, of your you know your situation your personal circumstances but there's this space that just people need a hand um just to, you know that accountability, that support, that education, that knowledge that they they just need that support in that space. And I think if if corporations, institutions, and you know, and also financial planning groups don't embrace that, they're going to lose these people because they're not going to be able to giving they're not going to be giving them the what they need at that time. And if they do provide them with that, then when they're ready, they will become financial planning clients. <laughs> 